laureates, and we're very honored today to have these three alumni with us, all of whom are groundbreaking figures in the semiconductor revolution that in fact continues to transform the way we navigate, communicate, and understand the world. Now, their work in fact amplifies and undergirds that of work done by other Rensselaer alumni and alumni. For example, the uh, integrated circuit was first invented at Texas Instruments, which was founded by J. Eric Johnson of the Rensselaer class of 1922. In fact, the Johnson Engineering Center is named for him. C. Sheldon Roberts of the Rensselaer class of 1948 was one of the founders of Fairchild Semiconductor, two of whose founders broke off to form Intel, which had the good sense to hire Dr. Ted Hoff as employee number 12. Uh, Ray Tomlinson of the Rensselaer class of 1963 really invented networked email, including the use of the at sign. Curtis R. Priam of the class of 1982 is a founder of NVIDIA, whose GPUs or graphical processing units are challenging and, and, and for certain uses, displacing CPUs as the basis for high performance computing. A group of Rensselaer alums led by Dr. David Ferrucci of the Rensselaer class of 1994 were key, that group was key to the development of the revolutionary IBM cognitive computing system, Watson. And frankly, our alumni, our faculty, and students continue to advance high performance computing, cognitive computing, uh, artificial intelligence, neuromorphic computing, natural language processing, computer vision, sensor technology, further development of advanced materials, and immersive systems of all kinds. But much of this work rests on the foundational achievements of our three guests. So let me introduce each one of them, and as I call their names, they will come forward to join me for a conversation. Our first guest received his Bachelor of Technology degree in electrical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras, India in 1969. His MS in electrical engineering from Rensselaer in 1971 and his PhD in electrical engineering from Rensselaer in 1974. He is an internationally recognized expert on power semiconductor devices, best known for his invention of the insulated gate bipolar transistor, or IGBT, while at General Electric Global Research in the 1970s. Now this power saving switched device and it was one that was designed to cut down on what are called leakage currents in devices, has revolutionized the field of power electronics with an enormous range of applications in transportation, lighting, medicine, defense, and renewable energy generation uh, systems. Now, at General Electric, our guest was named a Coolidge Fellow, the highest scientific rank in the company. In 1988, he joined the faculty of North Carolina State University where he is a distinguished university professor and founding director of the Power Semiconductor Research Center. Hear this, he holds 120 US patents, has written 19 books and nearly 600 scientific articles and has founded four startups based on his research. Among his many honors, he received the 2010 National Medal of Technology and Innovation. He is a 2015 recipient of the Global Energy Prize. He was inducted into the Rensselaer Alumni Hall of Fame in 2013 and the National Inventors Hall of Fame in 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, and please join me in welcoming Dr. B. Giant Balaga. and he is a giant. <laughs> Our next guest received his undergraduate degree in electrical engineering from Rensselaer 1958 and graduated already holding two patents for railway signaling devices he invented at his college summer job with the uh, General Railway Company in Rochester, New York. In 1959, he received his MS in electrical engineering 
from Stanford University, and in 1962 his PhD in electrical engineering, also from Stanford. As a graduate student and postdoctoral researcher at Stanford, he investigated neural networks. I remember those. And with Professor Bernard Woodrow, developed the least mean square algorithm, which is used today in data analytics and machine learning. In 1968, he joined the fledgling Intel Corporation, where he invented the microprocessor, the first electronic circuit that combined complicated computer functions on a single silicon chip. This single chip had as much computing power as the first electronic computer, ENIAC, which in 1946 filled the room. His microprocessor, a flexible general purpose device, that focused on programming rather than hardwiring, created a revolution in computing and in fact helped Intel to become what it is today. In 1980, he was named the first Intel Fellow, the highest technical position in the company. In 1982, he joined Atari, and in 1986 became Vice President and Chief Technical Officer with Teclicon, Inc., an agency that provides experts for intellectual property disputes. He received the 2009 National Medal of Technology and Innovation and has been inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. He is both a member of the Rensselaer Alumni Hall of Fame and a Davies Medal for Engineering Achievement winner. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Marcian Ted Hoff. Our next guest received a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from Rensselaer in 1972 and a Master of Science, also in Electrical Engineering, in 1973. Hired by Eastern, Eastman Kodak that same year, he was asked to investigate something called the charge couple device, which had just been commercialized, to see if it had any practical applications. Now, a charge couple device but he'll tell you what it really is, is a light-sensitive sensor composed of an integrated circuit on a semiconductor surface which converts incoming photons, light, into electron charges. By 1975, our guest had invented both a prototype camera that would catch these signals and a system to display them initially on a television screen. He received a patent for his digital imaging system in 1978 and continued to break new ground in inventing ways to store, transmit, and manipulate digital images, including engineering the first modern digital single-lens reflex camera with a colleague in 1989. Now, the cultural, scientific, and technological impacts of his work are enormous. Because of his work, we learned quickly about the Tiananmen Square protests. We wrestle today with the questions about the meaning of the selfie culture. We have GoPro to capture personally thrilling adventures, and we know that the surface of Pluto, far from being featureless and frozen, is breathtakingly dynamic and beautiful. Among many other honors, our guest was awarded the 2009 National Medal of Technology and Innovation in recognition of his work. He was inducted into the Rensselaer Alumni Hall of Fame, has been honored with the Davies Medal for Engineering Achievement, and in 2012, we awarded him an honorary Doctor of Engineering degree. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Steve Sasson. We thought we would show off our bling to you today. <laughs> <laughs> now, gentlemen, each of you has invented fundamental technologies that have altered lives on a grand scale. Why don't you?
tell this Rensselaer audience, but in lay terms for Rensselaer audience, the essence of what you really did. And let's start with you, Ted. Well, Intel, as we pointed out, started off in 1968 to make semiconductor memory, but it was felt that market might take a bit of time to develop, so agreed to take on some other jobs, and one of which was to build calculators for a Japanese company. They agreed in April of 69 to do the work, but didn't really know what it was going to involve until June of that year. And they sent three engineers over with their specs, and I was assigned as liaison. Now this, Intel only had $3 million in financing, and this was potentially a $3 million order. But by this time, I knew enough about Intel's cost structure, and when I saw what they were asking us to do, it looked like we could not do it at the quoted price. So it was going to hurt the company if we went ahead. I brought my concerns to the head of the company, Bob Noyce, who said, if you think you have a way to fix it, why don't you do it? Because that seemed to be the most reasonable thing to do. We didn't want to walk away from the order, and it might have been dangerous to proceed with it. Well, in a few months, I figured out, hey, if I could make a really simple little computer, I could program it to do almost every one of the functions needed in the various chips that the uh, com that Japanese company was requesting. And actually, that's what we ended up doing, and it made a much better approach. And then it turned out we had an agreement where we could sell it to other people, and we started doing that. It was announced in November of 71, and it became an overnight success, you might say. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say. That's for sure. <laughs> Well, I've been involved with the Eastman Kodak Company my entire career, and as you all probably know, uh, George Eastman was the, basically the initiator of the democratization of the art of photography in the late 1800s, and photography was basically based on silver halide emulsions and chemical reaction, where an exposure of a, of a photographic film resulted in a latent image, and then with subsequent chemical processing, you got a visible image, and then with subsequent printing, you could create a print. And that was the mainstay and uh, the basic business model for photographic technology for over 100 years. Uh, when I arrived at Kodak, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, I had the opportunity to play with a new type of uh, charge couple device, uh, which was basically, as you pointed out, was, was if you do an exposure on the surface of this chip, it created a corresponding charge pattern, and that charge pattern then could be read out. Uh, when I asked to look at this, uh, I thought, well, if I'm going to study this device, perhaps I should measure the output. If I want to measure the output, then perhaps I should capture the output. And then maybe I should actually capture the, each pixel and turn it into a number. And then I thought, well, as long as I capture it, then maybe I could look at it. And uh, then I thought I had to build sort of a playback system. And so I, I, used, I picked parts from all over the laboratory and pulled together this system and built a prototype camera and playback system. The playback system built on... Microprocessor, <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, without that, we wouldn't have been able to reconstruct those images. Uh, and, uh, and, and subsequently, that was the, the architecture that we proposed and was patented in 1978, represents the fundamental architecture for digital cameras today. It's well, amazing. Brian. Uh, when I graduated from RPI in 1974, uh, the General Electric Company offered me a job to come and work on uh, power semiconductor devices. Uh, at that time, power semiconductor devices were already about 30 years old, having been uh, developed since the 1950s. And so it was felt that everything that could be done had already been done, and so it was not an exciting job prospect, but uh, unfortunately, or fortunately for me, it was the only job offer I received. <laughs> <laughs> so what I discovered was that there were two activities, one at companies like GE on the East Coast on bipolar devices, and a parallel activity on the West Coast on MOS devices. And each of these companies had their own manufacturing practices and end customers and applications. And so these two were considered to be, at that time, fundamentally incompatible and different from each other. Uh, I decided that perhaps there is merit in combining the physics 
of the MOS and bipolar devices into a new type of uh, device. And I proposed that to GE, and there was considerable skepticism. <laughs> there was also feeling that this would produce an averaging effect, which would not be very exciting. But I, through my computations and uh, analysis, felt that I could get a quantum leap in performance, uh, actually a million-fold increase in power gain. So uh, fortunately for me, I wouldn't be sitting here otherwise. Uh, I was successful, <laughs> successful in achieving that outcome. And that is the insulated gate bipolar transistor, which is now widely used in uh, every aspect of your life, in your homes, in your transportation systems, your cars, of course, and uh, trains and so on, in medical systems, renewable energy systems. So it has ended up having an enormous impact on society, and I'm very pleased with that. <laughs> now, in each of your stories, you know, one actually reads, uh, I would say, true confidence <laughs> and a willingness to uh, ignore conventional wisdom and to see potential where other people saw uh, dead ends. Um, can you say whether there was anything either in your Rensselaer education or in your education as engineers, but let's st start with Rensselaer, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that really had a, an influence on you to kind of give you that uh, chutzpah, as it were. <laughs> okay, let me start with you, Steve, because you, uh, you had a unique situation where you had a company that chose not to exploit uh, what he... Yeah, exactly. Uh, they weren't terribly excited about the concept that was proposed. Um, but uh, thinking about uh, RPI, uh, uh, two short stories. Uh, one having to do with my very first semester at RPI, uh, and one having to do with the very last semester at RPI, and had to do with two professors I met. First semester in physics, I had for recitation Dr. Robert Resnick. And oh, you yeah. May, you may know Dr. Robert Resnick. <laughs> And, uh, and I was just blown away by how elegantly he solved those problems that I had worked on for hours you know, <laughs> to try to get this. He used to walk into the room with that little smile he had, you know, and he would say, okay, you know, children, what's, what's bothering you? And uh, we, we would read the problem to him, and he never had notes. And he would just walk up, and as he was reading the problem, he would write, F equals M-A, you know. Or, <laughs> F equals M-A. And then in three steps, he so elegantly solved the problem, and I had pages of stuff. <laughs> and I was so uh, inspired by the elegance and the ease, and he taught me to look at the principles and s find out what you know and then go after what you don't know. And I, 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 I carried that with me. And then the last semester, uh, I had um, Dr. Uh, Sarheb Gandhi, uh, we spoke about him the other day. And um, he, he, he ran a survey class uh, for, uh, for uh, electron devices. He was the department chair, chair of electrophysics department at the time. And quite frankly, I was very scared of him. I think most people were, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, we, he would come in, and it was a very loose class, and he would just lecture. And then after about the third class, someone got up the nerve to ask, well, how are we going to be graded in this class? And... And Dr. Gandhi just looked up and said, oh, I don't know, thrill me, teach me something. <laughs> Write me a paper and teach me something. So right then I knew I was dead because I was never going to be able to teach this guy anything. <laughs> but I was interested in how light affected silicon. My master's project had something to do with that. And so I thought, well, I might not be able to teach him something, but maybe I could teach myself something. And so I read a bunch of papers on this and I proposed some structures I had absolutely no business doing. Uh, and I remember typing up my thesis on Easter vacation and uh, thinking, oh, I'm just, he's going to fail me. This is it. I'm, I, I, where am I going to stay over the summer to take up a makeup course? And uh, anyway, I submitted this, and, uh, and I got it back, and, and he gave me an A, and I, and I kept this. And he wrote on the back, he said, uh, I'd like a copy of this paper. I don't agree with everything you've written here, he said, but you've done some thinking here. And I was really moved by that. And what he taught me was that you don't have to be an expert in a field in order to make an original contribution. And I carried that with me when I started looking at new types of imaging at Kodak. That's interesting. Thank you. Dr. Bolliger. 
Well, I'd like to say that Steve had it easy. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Gandhi was my PhD advisor. How would you like? <laughs> I did have it easy. That's right. <laughs> So uh, my experience is that uh, I graduated from IIT Madras in 1969, and I, when I applied for graduate school, uh, RPI uh, gave me not only admission but financial aid. So I'd like to say that RPI had the vision to see that I would make great contributions to society. <laughs> uh, but the truth is actually quite different. When I arrived here, I found out that I was the first student from India in the electrophysics department and that faculty had great reservations about Indian students being successful with our very tough curriculum. Uh, fortunately, I was able to maintain a 4.0 grade point average and got the <laughs> Allen B. DuPont Prize. So after that, the floodgates opened up and they let in <laughs> a lot of Indian students. So that experience gave me great confidence that I could be successful in the United States. But let me say that the more important thing that happened to me at RPI was that Professor Gandhi showed me that you have to take great risk in order to have great rewards and achievements. And the particular thing I'd like to point out is that when I proposed to do my PhD, I wanted to grow gallium indium arsenide films for making high-speed transistors. And he said, why don't you take uh, trimethyl gallium and triethyl indium and combine it with arsine gas and grow these films? So I went to the library and I looked into these materials and I found that trimethyl gallium and triethyl indium detonate on exposure to air. <laughs> <laughs> they don't just burn, they detonate. And, and arsine uh, is an extremely poisonous gas. So, <laughs> so he was asking me to build a weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> and uh, when I went back to him and I ex explain my trepidity in trying to do this, uh, he said, don't worry, I'll buy you a canary if you <laughs> <laughs> And he still owes me one canary. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent about a year and a half uh, building this reactor with a colleague, and we spent a lot of time in making sure that all our joints were leak-proof, and, <laughs> and we were very afraid of not only hurting ourselves, but the whole, uh, all the people in the building. And after uh, another year and a half, I was successful in actually growing very high quality films. And at that point, uh, Professor Gandhi said, I think it's time you leave <laughs> and get a job. <laughs> uh, but this method is now called organometallic CVD and is used today across the board for making films for everything, for uh, high-speed transistors, lasers, LEDs, and so on. And in fact, uh, last year I had the privilege of meeting two of the Nobel laureates who received the uh, Nobel Prize for the Blue LED in 2014. And based on my work, the first commercial MOCVD reactors were put together in the early 80s, and they used those reactors to grow the films to make their blue LEDs. So I feel that RPI had a role in actually making even that technology feasible. Cool. So this is, this is the important lessons for me and a great privilege to have been educated at RPI. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, I was a pretty serious uh, electronics hobbyist even before I came to RPI. I had even built myself an oscilloscope from scratch. But I didn't know that much about, you might say, the fundamentals. And RPI's you know, physics courses, math courses, and electronics courses really taught me an awful lot more about what was going on inside. Now, I, but maybe one of the most important situations, I had a summer job, and I'd noticed f phenomena in the transistors I was working with, which were very new at that time, and as a senior at RPI, you could either take this course or if you could get a faculty member to work with you, you could do a senior thesis. And I found a TA who said he would work with me and I did a thesis. And in the course of that, I discovered there were two researchers at Bell Labs that were experts in the kind of phenomena I was looking at. Who were they? Uh, their name were Ebers and Mole. <laughs> yeah, sure. Now, I was fortunate enough to get a National Science Foundation fellowship to do graduate study. 
And at this time, I'd never been west of Niagara Falls, you know, and I figured, why not go to California and Stanford University? So I arrive at Stanford, and I find out they have just hired John Mull. <laughs> so I rushed to sign up for his course, and for the first time, I learned what was going on inside those <laughs> semiconductor devices. And I think that helped me in the rest of my career, that sequence of that thesis, and then the course from John Mull. That's great. <laughs> Dr. Balaga, let me go back to you for a minute. You know, you've been called the man with the largest negative carbon footprint. And as one example among many, your uh, insulated gate uh, bipolar transistor allowed the introduction of distributor-less electronic ignition systems in uh, vehicles, in automobiles. And this single efficiency means, in fact, that every gallon of gasoline lasts from two to four miles longer. In fact, over the last 25 years, uh, your invention has been credited with averting over 100 mil trillion, I'm sorry, pounds of carbon dioxide emissions. Can you tell, the, tell us how the IGBT uh, enables more sustainable technologies? Uh, well, the IGBT is basically a semiconductor switch which enabled a transformation in the way power electronics uh, was done and is now being done. So it used to be done uh, with analog control with what was known as uh, phase control uh, methods. And by having the IGBT available, they transformed it to digital control of power and with PWM signals. Uh, but from a user standpoint, this enabled the IGBT to be used in all kinds of consumer appliances, like in your homes, it's in your refrigerator, it's in your washing machine, it's in your uh, microwave oven, and transportation, it's in all your cars, as you just heard, the electronic ignition system. All the new electric cars use it for running the motors. Uh, it's used in bullet trains in Japan, uh, and of course, all the lower power trains like that in airports and you know, urban transportation. It's used in all the medical systems uh, and so on. So to turn to the question you asked me about pollution, let me uh, mention that there are three of these applications which have had enormous impact on energy savings. The first is the electronic ignition system, and that improved fuel efficiency by 10%, and we, of course, uh, in the world use enormous amounts of gasoline, so that has reduced gasoline consumption by 1.5 trillion gallons each gallon produces 19.4 pounds of carbon dioxide, and that's one reason why pollution has gone down. But the other side is in improving electrical efficiency. By using the IGBT, it was possible to control motors in a completely new way known as adjustable speed drives. And motors consume today in the world two-thirds of all the electricity that we use. So if you make them more efficient, you gain enormous electricity savings. And the adjustable speed drives improved efficiency by an enormous 40%. So this, of course, had huge implications on energy savings. The third uh, element is in lighting. And lighting consumes about one-fifth of all the electricity in the world. And, of course, for about 100 years, we have relied on the incandescent bulb that, of course, goes back to the days of Edison. And that has served as well. But it is a terribly inefficient technology with only about 5% or less of electricity being used for light. The rest of it is all wasted in heat. So by developing new types of lamps, uh, we did this at GE, and now, of course, they are, they are available as CFLs, compact fluorescent lamps. We have improved efficiency by 75% in lighting. So if you add all that up, it amounts to 73,000 terawatt hours of electricity savings over 25 years. And that's like not building 1,366 coal-fired power plants. So you imagine the cost savings, but also the reduction in pollution. And we have ended up saving about 100 trillion pounds of carbon dioxide. All of human activity produces about 50 trillion pounds per year. So this is like offsetting two years of human activity over a 25-year period. So that's a very nice thing to have achieved.
Dr. Hoff, you, in fact, have spoken publicly about your great concerns about a changing climate. But uh, you know, some of the developments notwithstanding, there's no question that there are power costs associated with the revolution sparked by the uh, microprocessor. In fact, an industry-sponsored report in 2013 estimated that on a global basis, the entire digital ecosystem consumes about 10% of the world's electricity. Now, so what advice would you give any young engineers we have in the audience uh, for making a world increasingly reliant on the internet of everything, uh, making it more energy efficient and sustainable? Well, I think there's a number of things. One, electrical power uh, should be coming down in cost. In fact, at our home in California, six years ago, we put in a photovoltaic system and to date, we've generated about 140,000 kilowatt hours of electricity with that system. And it has represented something in the order of a 14%, you might consider tax-free, return on net investment. And the cost of these systems is coming down. In fact, I've seen projections where they say that eventually photovoltaic power will be lower in cost than coal-fired power plants. So. One of the things is, if the more we can move in that direction, the worry about the electricity drawn by digital systems is, shouldn't be there. The other thing is, think of the number of automobile trips that are saved by things like online data searches, online shopping, and so on. And if they could ever get them programmed correctly, the GPSs in our cars might actually get us to our destination more efficiently. <laughs> so let me ask you this, Mr. Sasson. Uh, you also designed a system with, quote unquote, no consumables. And were you thinking about the environmental and health benefits of uh, making it possible to take and process photos without chemicals? And I say this to you as one who used to develop pictures with my father down in our basement. Uh -huh. We had a, a development <laughs> lab, and we definitely used chemicals. So what were you thinking about then? Well, I'm, I must admit, I, you know, the, the, the processing of chemicals uh, and the restoration, the recycling of chemicals was pretty well established by the time I got to Kodak, because photography had been around, like I said, for about 100 years. Um, and so I didn't really think much about it. I, I, it was more of a personal, I didn't like handling film. Uh, when you go to Kodak, they, they force you to take these photographic courses, and I had to develop film, and I never liked that. It wasn't really fun for me. And, um, and so I really thought of just uh, eliminating film uh, and eliminating consumables altogether, but I, I didn't really think about the environmental impact on it. However, uh, we worked on this you know, largely out of the public eye, of course, uh, from the 70s throughout the 80s and into the 90s, and... Um, when, you, when we had the technology together enough so that we could actually start to make practical systems, and that, that, that took us about 15 years, um, we, we desperately looked for places to try to find niches where we could get this technology to start to be applied. Now, notwithstanding a lot of the issues that Kodak had in marketing and dealing with customers that we sold film to, one of the most the first places that we were able to put digital photography systems in was exactly because of the environmental impact. It was on cruise ships. It was an invent, invent, uh, invent imaging class of, 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 of uh, application. Uh, simply because the cruise ships had significant, and everywhere they went, they had to follow all the rules of all the ports and they had to re keep all these chemicals and things like that. And so it was really the environmental impact that was one of the initial drivers to get people to start to use this. You know, in my introductory remarks, this is kind of a follow-on to you. Uh, I'm, I'll go back and forth between calling you by your first name. <laughs> <laughs> the folks here know how I am. Now, you know, many people, you know, we talked about selfies and so forth. And many people no longer feel that they need to own standalone, you know, cameras per se. Uh, because they use the cameras in their smartphones. Um, and the Apple... Uh, iPhone 7 now uses machine learning mm. software to mimic the uh, depth of effects of high quality cameras. What do you think the implications of all of this is? 
are, what the implications are, I should say, well, to the art of photography. The art of photography. Well, first of all, thank you for bringing up the selfie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I have my own. <laughs> I, I've been blamed for that, and I, I can tell you <laughs> in no uncertain terms that I never in my wildest dreams thought that people would be doing that, but uh, <laughs> it just wasn't in the plans. But, uh, but anyway, uh, to, your, to, to your point though, um, you're right, uh, photography has become a completely different uh, thing now. Right. It's no longer capturing an image, uh, you know, and, and, and preserving it and making it look beautiful. It's really a form of casual conversation. Uh, it, 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 it's sharing of emotions, you know. And, um, and so how does this affect the art of photography? Well, I must tell you, more people can take pictures today than ever before. They're shared more easily than ever before. So pictures are all around us, okay. But really, the art of photography is really the art of storytelling. And, and if you ever met a, a professional photographer and I've been very fortunate to have met many of famous photographers. They are fantastic storytellers, okay? N never get on a uh, speaking tour with these guys. <laughs> They're really good. Uh, and um, so really, it's, it, the camera is just a tool. Uh, it's the story that matters. And so you can tell a fantastic story w with an iPhone 7 or whatever we are referencing there. And it's enormous. It, the technology is mind-blowing to me. You know, to have a six-element lens, an f1.8 uh, lens in there, uh, uh, to, to put that into something that small is, is uh, I, I, agree. I thought if we could ever get to two million pixels, we were done, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so, so, so really, the technology's moved along, and it's enabled more people to do more art, okay? But a good storyteller is a good storyteller. So I'm going to... So I'm going to open this up for just a couple of questions um, because I know we're up against deadlines. Thanks. Uh, but let me ask you to thank again uh, these individuals because there's something very, two very deep things embedded in this discussion. And one is that there's a kind of synergistic effect between the, let's call them the hard technologies, the materials rooted activities that enable the development of uh, all of the things digital and computational that we so depend upon and take for granted and allows uh, there to be uh, machine learning software in an iPhone 7. At the same time, that very uh, set of breakthroughs in computation uh, push the boundaries of what the physical devices can do. But you really don't have one without the other. But you certainly don't have any of it without the real innovators. And I try to point that out to people. There's a good game people talk about innovation, but there is no innovation without innovators. And that's what these gentlemen are. And let's thank them. Uh, Greg's going to kill me, but is there, is there one? <laughs> right. Is there a question? Please. Yes, please. Um, so I, I found it interesting that of the panel, three of you are electrical engineers. So my question is for the future, um, what is going to be the makeup of the next panel four years from now? What, <laughs> graduate, what programs will they be from? Material science, biology, biochemistry? Physics. No. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there's, a, there's this merger that is actually literally going on uh, among the physical, the biological world, and, and computation. And, and I think somewhere in there is the pony. But, you know, none of us predicts the future. We only work toward it. <laughs> is there a, one last question? I, okay. Please. Uh, in retrospect, with your experience with the uh, inventing the CCD at a company that it would have basically cut the throat of the company if you implemented, is there any, 
is there any other way you could have presented uh, that opportunity which would have sold them on the business case? Well, presenting, uh, well, first of all, you have to pay attention to how you present to your audience. I, I made the mistake of calling my concept filmless photography. <laughs> <laughs> first mistake, first mistake. You have to pay attention to your audience. Um, uh, you know, you, you, have to, you have to take your idea and you have to realize the culture that you're in. I was in a very established culture. The photographic world, you know, was, was, let's use the word, dominated by Eastman Kodak Company, and it had been done so for over 100 years. And they had been very successful, and very few people could compete making film. And it was probably the most successful business model for a consumer product ever. I, I don't want to give you numbers, but it was scary. And so to come along and propose, oh, well, get rid of all of that, you know, oh, by the way, and go here, doesn't make you that popular. Uh, <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what, 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 what I tried to do was I, I tried to make this thing look more like a conventional camera, even though it didn't have to. Yeah. The example I, I used is uh, I could have stored on my first magnetic tape where I stored the digital information. I could have stored hundreds of images. And I thought that was really cool. But I chose to, to describe it as, as holding 30 images. I just set the bit rate at 30 halfway between 24 and 36, the two film lengths at the time, to make it look more like the world that we were in, yeah, right? And, and, you, and you, so, so you, you try to take away those secondary things and just go after those. You try to use your corporate culture. Don't fight it, you know? And that's what I tried to do. But corporate culture was really, really strong. And quite frankly, in 1976, when I was demonstrating this system, uh, there was a lot of technology that needed to be developed. And, and when asked how long it would take, I, I, I used Moore's Law because it was all digital system. I didn't know if Moore's Law have applied to CCDs, but I was desperate, so I, I, I just used it. And I, I came up with between 15 and 20 years. And when you're in a corporate environment and you say 15 or 20 years, That's the right. corporate guys don't get that excited, right? <laughs> and so I was allowed to work on it uh, my entire career. I worked in digital imaging ever since 1975 and nothing else. Okay, doing all the different aspects of it. I was not allowed to talk about any of this work until 2001. Okay, so I, I, I couldn't, we couldn't publish things, I couldn't write papers or anything like that. But we did this work and we filed patents, of course. And so the company did very well on an intellectual property basis, okay, but they could not leave the existing profit, um, the, the, the business model that was so profitable for something that was so unknown. And that, in the end, eventually uh, destroyed the company. Those are life lessons, yeah. as we've learned from all of our panelists. Thank you very much. <laughs>